All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome Sandeep Dayal, who is in Chicago. How are you doing, Sandeep? I'm doing great and delighted to be here with your audience. Yeah, and uh, Sandeep's a seasoned marketing and strategy leader at the consulting firm uh, Sorrenti Marketing Group. Uh, he serves as a counselor to C-suite executives and board members at Fortune 500 companies and has helped blockbuster brands around the globe. You have been a, con you're a contributor to Marketing Management, McKinsey Quarterly, Strategy and Business, and you have a book that was released in December, uh, just in December, Branding Between the Ears, Using Cognitive Science to Build Lasting Customer Connections. Perfect, and there you see it. And what we're gonna talk about today is what's wrong with the old way of branding and how cognitive brands are different from traditional brands. Um, so let's, get, let's just jump straight into it, Sandeep. What do you mean by cognitive brands? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, it, it, when you go through my book, essentially I talk about this idea that all of the information that we process, which re relates to all the information that we process about brands also, is processed by our brain. And that's why the book is called, you know, uh, Branding Between the Years, because the whole notion is that now what is happening is that with all the understanding that we have from different cognitive sciences about how exactly our brain works, specifically with respect to making choices and branding is all about making choices that understanding is leading us to have a better understanding of how to design brands how to design brand experiences and so on so my entire focus and the the thrust of this book is around how you can use that information from cognitive sciences to design better brands and brand experiences yeah. So, um, so let's get into it. So you say, how do you, how do you start to look at building a brand to match the way the brain works? Right. Right. So I think, so the first, you know, the starting step is to really understand how the brain works and yeah. really the way that the brain work, if you think about it, is that it makes choices by relating those choices to our experiences, our past experiences, or by relating them to our fantasies, you know, enabling us to deal with our or you know realize our fantasies. So, in in essence, when you want to understand how you're going to design future brands, you want to see how those brands can serve as these keys, what I call cognitive keys, that can trigger sensations of those past experiences that you had in your life. Uh, the positive ones, the cherished experiences that you've had, or make you feel like with that brand, you're going to take that next step into realizing the fantasies or the aspirations that you've had in your mind. Yeah, you know, that's, um, that, that's really interesting. And when you so when you're talking about this, you're talking about these, ex the experiences that co that could connect you to a brand could come from anywhere. I mean, they could come from way back in childhood, they could come from, you know, recent experiences. So I mean, that's kind of a wide gamut, right? So how do, how do you how do you kind of hone in and figure out what are the ones you need to trigger or how do you go about trying to trigger those? Right. And that's a great question. And when I started, in fact, in my research and in my work, when I started to delve into that question, there are some three different things that come out. So one is this whole notion of connectedness, if you need, if you will, or I call it in my book, I call it brand wives, which is how do you drive that connection to the brand. So that's one part of it. The second part of it is, you know, how do you make sense of the brand? You know, when the brand is saying something to you, does it either subconsciously or consciously make sense to you? And then finally, how does it, how does the brand drive you to resolve, which is where you actually say, okay, this all makes sense. I feel connected to it. And then you go out and actually make that purchase. So it's all of those three elements which have become very important. And by the way, John, you know, you will see that uh, in the past, when we talked about branding, we didn't talk about brand empathy at all. We didn't talk about mm -hmm. brand values at all. We didn't talk about this whole notion of connectedness. But this science is now making that and uh, making that come to the very forefront. 
Um, yeah, you know, absolutely. And to be honest, I mean, it's still to this day, a lot of people think brand is logo. So uh, rather than experience, rather than the totality of the experience. Uh, but then you say, I'd be say that connected piece, all right? That that seems to that seems to be like if you like the holy grail in some ways, and always seems yeah. like the hardest thing, hardest thing to achieve. I mean, consumer brands. Obviously, we got great examples of how some consumer brands do it. But when you're in kind of B two B sales or corporate, I mean, that's where I think brands really, really struggle because that's when I think you fall between a number of different stools. Uh, yes. Um, and, um, you know, so when you, I mean, the whole idea of how our brain works uh, doesn't necessarily uh, go away when you go to B2B brands, right? Sure. I mean, the brain, the brain is the brain. It works in the same way. And when you're doing B2B sales, you have to, I think B2B salespeople will tell you that firsthand, that you've got to have that connection with the buyer, right? And so how do they feel like um, that you have a shared chemistry? How do they feel like you understand how they're feeling and how they're how they're facing their challenges when they can feel like hey this guy really gets me that is when that b2b sale also becomes easier so that's kind of that whole connectedness piece of it now you still have to make sense right i mean b2b sales people are, are going to do spreadsheets you know especially if you're selling them a big ticket item they are going to do a spreadsheet they have to take it up to their bosses and get uh, you know consensus on that and that is a part of it but there is also how does it relate to their past experience right i mean they have, mm -hmm. because these guys have this is not their first rodeo this is not the first time they're doing business so what happens is as people do business over time they start to form certain learnings and when i'm talking about these experiences that you tap into really what i mean is that when you have a lifetime of experiences which all of us do yeah you are all the time forming certain rules in your mind, right? Those rules are really your learnings, right? And those learnings are you are, is something that you're gonna use. So for example, one of the common, what is called cognitive biases, which I call like cognitive wisdom or rules is like, you know, don't overcomplicate things. Mm -hmm. the, you know, given two choices, the simple answer is the better answer. A lot of people believe that, right? That that's the kind of a learning that we've had. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when you're doing a, even a B2B sales, if you can position your, product as something that is not the overly complicated answer that that is the simpler answer to their problem that is going to immediately appeal to the person that has that kind of a learning in their minds right um so it is really important even in b2b sales to understand what those things are another kind of learning that many people have is you know not to be greedy so to speak you know like a burden hand mm -hmm. towards two yeah. in the bush you know what is that saying it's really saying you know take what you've got right now, right? Yeah, Even yeah, if there yeah. are certain things that appear to be better. So if you're in B2B sales, I mean, if that is the kind of learning that person has, the decision maker has, then they're going to be very much focused on what is it tangibly you're offering right now? Because that's mm -hmm. the word in hand, right? And other things that you're promising about, oh, my software is going to do X, Y, and Z in the future, and we're working on this, and we're working on that. Well, that's the two birds in the bush, right? So, <laughs> so you got to really understand how people's minds work because people use these kinds of learnings and uh, to make real choices. Now, in consumer products, where it's been studied, people say that these types of learnings are accounting for 95% of the choices. Really? Imagine that. You know, we all think we are so rational and we take these decisions more deliberately. <laughs> but... Psychologists are finding that that happens only 5% of the time. 95% of the time, it's that rule that you form, right? That pushes you over the edge. And that is no different. You know, we like to think that in B2B sales, nah, it's all very different and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think maybe it's not 95% in B2B sales, but it's still got to be at least 50-50, if not 60-40 or something like that. You know, so your spreadsheets yeah. and your tangible case still matters, but... It's the other learnings that you need to tap into and understand when you're dealing with a human buyer. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And I think sometimes we do ourselves a disservice because sometimes I think when we walk through the door of our B2B company, we suddenly forget our buying experiences. We suddenly forget that we're consumers too. And we suddenly go about things in, in a different way. I think it's quite an interesting psychological thing. What I wanted to ask you um, next about is, 
So there's been a lot of talk recently, like people are talking about empathy and, you know, values and all the company. And a lot of people have, I personally feel, and maybe I'm doing them a disservice. There's a lot of, there's a lot of lip service being paid to it. There's a lot of bumper stickers being placed on people's websites, et cetera. How do you actually build a brand with empathy and build a brand with value that's real, that's authentic, that's not something that's just doing it because it seems to be a fad right now? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and I make two clear distinctions between what are brands with empathy and brands with values. Mm -hmm. And you are right to ask that question, because what happens is that people are not precise about their definitions. And that's what you need. You need precision here. So the way that I define empathy is when you can say to someone or the consumer who's buying your product feels like you understand how they feel. So I know I know they're saying to the brand, I know that you understand how I feel. And when that connection is missing, that social chemistry is missing, you see the disconnects. Let me just give you an example from the consumer world. And, and you know, I'm sure that there are parallels in the B2B world. So very recently, so we're talking about breaking news. You know, this is like last yeah. month. The, you had Samsung, which has that, you know, fitness watch and everything that they sell. They came out with a television commercial, which you can see on YouTube. But essentially, this commercial shows this uh, this woman who gets up at two in the morning. We see her get up at two in the morning and then she just wants to go for a run. She just wants to do what she wants to do. And she sort of goes out and she has, you know, she goes running at 2 a.m. in the morning, what feels like uh, in New York somewhere, you know. Mm -hmm. And this ad on one hand was trying to sort of show about you know how women can do whatever they want to do and so on but this ad actually hit a brick wall and the reason was that most women that said to this saw this television commercial they said look samsung do you really get that women can't really get up at two in the morning and just go out running in the middle of a new york city you know yeah. it was kind Especially of like, now. Especially <laughs> now and it's like you know it's just it's just not something that women Women, or even for that matter, a lot of men can do. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's really not safe to do that. You know, to go go do that something like that. So that is where something that is a very slickly produced ad. I mean, you'll see the ad and you'll see, oh wow, this is really slick. But it is failing to connect. Why? Because the consumer is saying, I don't think you understand how I feel. The consumer is saying, my reality is very different than what you're showing on this commercial. So the connection is missing. So you know they were they got a lot a lot of flack for that ad and so on. So you have to really understand that these things have to, uh, that you have to find, you have to sort of really deeply probe and understand how people are really feeling. Just putting a wrapper of empathy on things doesn't work. And likewise, you have, when you talk about brands with values, that's a different thing. And you've seen that so many companies, including Shell Oil and so on, let's talk about B2B space, People had to take a stand with their brands on what their position in doing business with Russia is going to be, right? And some businesses were ahead in that curve and some businesses weren't because they weren't so clear about their values. And what happens with values is that people will do business with you if they feel like they can, sh that the brand shares the same values that they have, right? So there was a lot of pressure on brands to really be very clear about what they were going to do about doing business with Russia and so on. And it became very important. And that conversation right now is not happening enough in the board, in the boardrooms. You know, the boardrooms need to sit down and understand, here's what, here's what the values of our company are. And this is what we believe in so that when those crises occur, they have a very clear direction that they can take. But because boardrooms are not having those conversations about their brands today, they react to them when the crisis happens. And when you react to something in the crisis mode, when you don't understand your values, then you're likely to very much muck it up. Yeah. And I think the the other big challenge is that, um, you know, for companies is that you have to be consistent in your application of these values. And I think that's where you, um, to, to your point about missing the missing the target with the with the woman going out jogging in the middle of the night, I think you can you can um, you know communicate your values. But if those values aren't applied equally in all situations, like if you say, okay, I'm going to we're not going to do business in Russia, but we're going to continue to do business in this country over here that <laughs> is not in the news right now, but has equally just bad. But as they're not in the news, nobody's going to notice. So, I mean, yeah. I think that's the, the big challenge is, is, is being consistent. 
Yes, and that consistency happens if you've had those conversations in the boardroom. Otherwise, yeah. you're sort of reacting to these on a crisis by crisis basis. Yeah. Um, so here's the here's an here's the other part. I think today is people are so overwhelmed. It's just so overwhelmed. They're just bombarded, and so there's a number of things that happen. Number one, it's like you know you've got cognitive overload, so people are just kind of switching off. So a lot of the messages and information isn't getting through to begin with. The other part I think is people perceive everything nowadays, regardless of whether it's B to C, B to B, they, they, they perceive nearly everything is commoditized, right? Everything is pretty much the same, right? I can swap in and swap out, particularly if they're technology solutions. So, you know, grabbing the attention of, of, of people and then like being able to show them that you're, that you're not a commodity, that you offer something more or different or a different experience. Those are massive challenges today. Now, they certainly are. And I think, uh, though, I think marketers often misunderstand that challenge. So, yes, there's more competition, there's more messaging, there's more channels and all of those things, right? So people are getting barraged by messages coming, you know, 360 degrees from these omni channels. Mm -hmm. And that has led marketers to believe, and this is a false assumption, that, hey, since so much is happening, I just need to get my message out in a very short amount of time frame because attention spans are short so i need to get my attention out in a very i need to get my mm -hmm. message out in a very short time frame and that's actually a false assumption because you know what if i sneeze you can you know you shrunk your message down to five seconds but is it you know am i really going to pay attention in five seconds what if i just miss it what if i look away so it's uh what is actually the where the bar is really going up and attention spans are not getting shorter by the way attention spans are as long as ever however the bar for grabbing people's attention is actually longer you know that is is higher if you will so mm -hmm. what you have to do you have to use cognitive science and there's a lot of things that have come out in cognitive science that uh, that help you understand these things but for example one of the learnings is that if you want people to notice something you need to put in surprises you need to do more than what they expect right so you know how historically we've said meet your customers expectations yeah 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 the reality is that if you just meet people's expectations, it kind of just, you know, blurs. It's kind of, you know, the glaze over it because you've done what they expected. It's not a big deal, right? But if you do something that is surprisingly good, you know, so you have this whole phrase that is going around, for example, these days, surprise and delight. So when you do something that is surprisingly good, people suddenly say, oh, that's extraordinary. I need to pay attention to this. And then they'll give you all the attention that you need, right? So that is... Uh, that is something that is very important, even in B2B sales, to figure out how can you do things which are beyond the ordinary, because everybody else is also doing the ordinary. So that's like one of the findings that's come out. Another kind of finding that's come out is that when you're talking to people, you need to have some good storylines, right? Nice. It's not enough to just go to people and say, hey, there are three things that are in my product right and i'm going to now reel those three things off because that's like a list of things it's not a story you need to learn yeah. to tell a story about what your product is what it does how it changes people's lives how it changes the business of the customer and so forth you can't just go there and say here are the three things that are better about my it's you know it's safer it's faster and it's uh, cheaper you know that people will forget you won't you won't remember those three even those three little things you won't remember five minutes later so it's got to be an engaging story so storylines and patterns and these types of things are things that the brain engages on so that's why i say that it's the bar for grabbing people's attention that has gone up it's not a knee jerk reaction of saying i need to shrink everything down yeah, I know. I, th I think that's a. I think that's a great point, and uh, you know, particularly, particularly the idea. I think of surprising people. I'm, and I guess, to be honest, I mean, the good news is, uh, <clears throat> the bar, the uh, you know, surprising people. If you give them a delight or surprising experience, a lot of times you don't have to actually do that much more to do it because they people have become so used to you know, basically getting crappy service. So if you give them something really good and, and I think that's where, I think that's where we are. I think people are craving that extra element, yes, yes, even extra more thing. so probably after the, the pandemic. You know, one of the things that it, it's, this is kind of, you know, just my personal experience. So this is one time I was flying from Chicago to um, Chicago to um, Zurich on, uh, on Swiss Air. 
And, you know, so I'm sitting there, I'm in business class and I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, sort of drinking, they bring our, mm -hmm. I, I like wine. So then they bring the wine I, and they give me the choices. You know, I try everything. I'll try all three wines before <laughs> making up my mind. So, you know, so I'm going there and, and this, uh, the air hostess there brings in this, this wine that I like. It's a French wine and it was just amazing. It was like really good. I said, wow, this is a great wine. So when she later on came around and said, hey, you know, we're going to, uh, do you want to buy anything from the duty free shop and this and that, and they give you that brochure. And I said, look, I don't need anything from the duty-free shop, but I'd love to get a bottle of that wine. You know, can I buy, just buy one bottle of that wine from you? And she said, sure. You know, she didn't miss a beat. She said, sure. And then later on, she walks over to me and there's the duty-free bag and there's the bottle of wine. And I take out my, um, you know, American Express card to hand over to her to charge it. And then she says, with our compliments, you know. So uh -huh. it's, it's that little moment, you know, a $50 bottle of wine that she sort of gives for free you know, in a $5,000 ticket, it's not, you know, it's not a big yeah. deal. She takes that call. And, but, you know, if I think about that eight hour flight from Chicago to Zurich, I really don't remember anything else about that flight except for that one moment. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, because otherwise you're traveling on business class all the time and you get the same thing, you know, get nice food, you get, you know, wine, this and this, it's kind of thing. But she made that one moment special by just exercising that little bit of judgment on her side, which now makes me, Remember this story. Remember the storyline. Yeah. So it makes me remember the story, and it made me write about it in, uh, <laughs> in the book. And you know, how much is the worth of that for Cesare, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I love that. It's a great story, and uh, and I think for people, you know, listening, it doesn't even have to be a fifty dollar bottle of wine. It's like I, I recall in another story, is I recall having to call Amazon one time about something, and uh, you know. I, I had zero expectations. I thought, oh, Amazon customer support, it's going to be yeah. wherever and it's going to be terrible. And so I got through and I explained what happened. And the first thing the woman said to me, she said, oh, Mr. Golden, I am so sorry that happened to you. I really am. Let's go. Let's figure out this out. And I was like, oh. Okay, and now I was in. Now I was in a completely different mood because I'm like feeling yeah. that she actually took those moments to say those words to say, "Oh, I'm actually sorry that you're having this issue." Yeah, that's empathy for you. See, that's where she's communicating to you that she understands how you feel. So that's you know that's a perfect example of using brand empathy to establish a connection with someone, and that's by just doing that, she just disarmed you in that moment. Yeah, we're totally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so listen, uh, uh, all of Sandeep's information is going to be below this video. And the book is Branding Between the Years, Using Cognitive Science to Build Lasting Customer Connections. Uh, but before we go, Sandeep, please do tell people a little bit more about you and uh, your book and the work you do. Yes, so this is what the book's like. book looks like, Branding Between the Years. It's about uh, all the work that we've done using cognitive sciences in my consulting company all around the world and bringing to, uh, in bringing to market some of the greatest brands in the world. Uh, if you want to get uh, more information on the kind of stuff that we do, please go to my author site, which is simply sandeepdayal.com. And from there, I periodically, you know, put these stories around, like the Swiss Air story, like the uh, Samson story and people can comment on those things. So yes, uh, please do go check out my website and sign up uh, for my blogs. Great. Listen, thanks again, Sandeep. Thank you all for watching and listening, and I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.